No, that it's only for the the boardroom. Okay, oh. I see the meeting is now uh, streaming live, so I'd like to call to order uh, the Berrien County it's Board of Health. Done. Okay, yeah. let's give it a minute. It's not quite done. Okay. We'll let you know when we're live. Patience oh. isn't one of my virtues. Can we say, oh. can we say and live? <laughs> yes. so the meeting we, is now uh, yes. streaming live, so I'd like to call to order. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's give it a minute. It's not quite done. There is a delay. Okay. We'll let you know when we're live. Patience isn't one of my virtues. You're going to want to mute that uh, or just close it. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. There's a little bit of a delay and it was playing in our area. So I think we're I think we're good to go now. All right. I'd like to call the Berrien County Board of Health uh, meeting to order. And I'd like to ask Kim to do a roll call. Uh, I, I'll do that. Um, Peg Coring. Here. Bill Chickering. Here. Dr. McBride. Here. Vanessa Brown. Here. Linda Stroll. Here. Ray Matejic. Here. Joe Wasserman. Here. Dr. Edwards. Here. Lisa. Here. Thank you, Brooke. Um, Nikki Britton. Here. Jillian Conrad. Here. Courtney Davis. Hey. Got it. Dr. Joe Hansen. Here. And of course, me, Kim Rogers. All right, thank you um, for the technology and uh, thanks for getting everything together in the midst of everything else that's going on. We really appreciate your leadership, your <coughs> weekly meetings with Spectrum and just amazing. The dashboard, just really appreciate everything that you're doing. So um, let's move to approvals. Uh, Lisa, we can't see the vouchers, but um, what do they look like? <clears throat> we, we have an updated version of the agenda. There are no vouchers for approval today. Yeah. My apologies. That's good. I don't like not seeing them, so that's good. All right, uh, moving to resolutions. Jillian? Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, we have two resolutions today that we are bringing forward for your uh, endorsement. Um, the first one that you have in front of you is a acceptance of some grant funding from the Spectrum of Lakeland Community Wellness Endowment. We applied a couple of months ago to uh, seek some funding in support of the Benton Harbor Farmers Market. And we were successful in our application and have been awarded $5,000 from the endowment fund. And again, that funding will support the ongoing operations of the market. Right now, we are still in the midst of planning for exactly how the market will look in this new normal that we are experiencing in COVID-19 times. We're suspecting that there will be some additional measures put in place with social distancing, some hand hygiene happening down there as well. But given the importance of the market as uh, you know, a great opportunity for a lot of residents to get fruit, fr fresh fruits and vegetables, we, we really wanted to make sure that we were able to keep operating that, especially with a lot of the uh, residents who live in the Harbor Towers area participating in the prescriptions for health program that Spectrum Health Lakeland intends to run again this summer. We're also pleased to see that the state has extended the use of the pandemic EBT card to be able to be eligible for double up food bucks. So that does open up a whole new um, just group of people who weren't able to use double up food bucks who now will be eligible for that. So um, with your endorsement, we would like to accept the grant award. <clears throat> All right. Um, Motion to accept. Okay. Second. Okay. So uh, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carried. Moving on to the second. Yes, the second resolution is a uh, resolution to apply for some grant funding. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has put out a request for proposals for a minority health uh, capacity building grant. And for those of you who've been around for a little while on our board, you might remember that we had a grant called Minority Health Equity Capacity Building Grant quite some time ago from 2010 to 2013. This is a very similar grant program um, from the exact same division department office out of MDHHS. And it is uh, really aimed at building capacity within our community to understand the social determinants of health, the root causes and start to address those issues. So we are seeking to apply for this funding in the amount of $42,000 for the grant year, uh, fiscal year 21 with the opportunity to have subsequent years of funding totaling three years potentially. Um, we have had some amazing work happen over the last uh, seven or eight years, especially with partnership uh, with Spectrum Health Lakeland and their population health division. So there is uh, a lot that we are working on together in seeking application for this grant. Um, one of the things that we're, we're really hoping to do, and I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit later here, is expand some of the work that we've done using some of our informal community leaders, um, especially in the Benton Harbor area as kind of mouthpieces or messengers, carrying some of the public health messages that we know are so important, particularly to do with COVID-19. But our idea with this grant funding is that we'll be able to extend some of that work that's been done here during this pandemic to um, you know, other health areas and making sure that messages are able to continue to be spread throughout the community um, in kind of some of those informal ways, especially into pockets of the community that are historically harder to reach. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, all right. Um, so may I have a motion for uh, applying for the $42,000 grant from so Minority moved. Health? Second. Okay, so I didn't see who moved. McBride. Okay. Thanks, Dr. McBride. And uh, Linda, you second? I okay. did, Vanessa. Vanessa. Vanessa did, okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, any discussion? I, I just see how COVID oh. has unequally uh, impacted people and I just wish there was more money, but this is a good start. Dr. McBride, do you have a, a comment? No, I mean, you're right. Um, about a third of those who um, get the virus in the day dashboard data are African American, but the majority who die are African American. Mm -hmm. So the devastation, both in getting the disease and the dying from the disease, is very disproportionate. And our county is not untypical of the nation. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important start. So hey. we, uh, someone else want to speak, Linda? No. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carried. Um, moving down, if, if I've got the right agenda, to health department uh, administrative reports. Uh, Nikki at all? Yeah, so we're going to um, go through a, a PowerPoint. We have some slides here for you to work through, and it's going to be collaborative effort here. We wanted to spend some time just really talking about what is the department been doing. So our intent here is to give you uh, a, a bit more of an understanding of the breadth of our response and what we've been doing. So um, next slide. And now, nope, go back up one and then go to the dashboard. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Johansson to talk through um, the situational update and what, we, what we've got going on and, and some of the data. Good morning, everybody. I wish I was here in person with you guys. I miss you all. So, but we'll try to do it virtually. Um, so we had a board of health member. We've always had a doctor on the board. Uh, we're privileged to have him now. But once upon a time, we had a Dr. Bill Emery, who many of you have known and remember. He was here for a long time. And Dr. Emery would routinely ask, what is public health? 
And he has that um, over and over and over again. So I'm going to uh, give you the numbers here and just talk a little bit about our history and give you a snapshot of what public health is currently like. So public health, what is it? So it's local health departments. It's There's a lot of epidemiology in it, of course. There's testing, there's contact tracing, there's partnerships, and there's PPE. That's a relatively new one. So those are ones I'll just touch on briefly. But all public health is local is something you hear often. And ultimately, it comes down to how we're doing locally and what is happening in a community. We have a great community. And I have to say, as the one contractual partner in this room, our staff is doing a great job of working really, really hard all the time, and they go above and beyond. So I say that about all of them. And the people sitting around the table here and other leadership have just stepped up to the plate and just done a dramatic job, working very, very long hours, working well as a team, and it's been really a great, great thing to see. The leadership has been really great. Um, we still have other critical activities going on beside COVID too, and those things are still going on. There are health departments that have abandoned in our county, and our state, right, that have abandoned other activities like immunization center. We continue to do what we consider critical things. And Nikki will show you some of those in the PowerPoint. So all public health is local. There's always a lot of prevention in public health. The second thing is there's always epidemiology in public health. And so you have a dashboard, which has been put together very nicely. And um, it's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than just about everybody else's dashboards out there. So you can see some of the numbers we, we have um, that are updated. So we have 489 cases that are, these are the confirmed and are presumed cases. So those, so that's that group. And then we're keeping track of those that have recovered. So that's the 204 number, which continues to grow. And each one of them, you can see the demographics, uh, what's going on. Under deaths, that was what pointed out, you can see that our deaths are just like um, we've seen elsewhere um, across the country and across the state. So the majority of our deaths, unfortunately, are Af African Americans. Um, our deaths are just like we said in the very beginning in a board of health meeting here. I said this is going to affect 80 year olds, more than 70 year olds, more than 60 year olds. And if you age adjusted, it, that's true. So almost half of our deaths are 80 plus year olds. And, and so that, that is our you know, huge big number. We only have two under 60. Every one of our cases that have died has multiple comorbidities. And that is true like in New York City studies and in Michigan studies, uh, 93, 94% of all the people that die from COVID have at least two comorbidities, which is, uh, which is an astounding and, and sad number. You can see from the map where where our COVID is, and it is spread out throughout the uh, our county. Um, there are some spots that are a little bit higher, but it looks like we have sort of a corridor right down the center. That's in large part of a function of where our first you know, outbreaks came and, and when they were. Um, so we've always said that it's gonna be a vulnerable population issue and it's gonna be an age issue. And that has certainly proved true. There've been a lot of things that have changed as we work through this. That's one thing that has pretty much not been changing. Uh, third, testing. So our strat we've always had a strategy, but our strategy has continually had to evolve. It's had to evolve based on how many tests we have available and who we could get the tests from. So in the very beginning, all our tests had to go to the state lab, which was very, very limited. We had to uh, sometimes beg for more tests. Um, and so unfortunately, I had the responsibility of ordering all those tests from wherever they came and had to get them through the state. We were very fortunate sometimes to be able to do a little bit of leverage when there was a concert, for instance, that had um, a COVID positive singer unbeknownst to her. Uh, we were able to pick four people that were very close to that individual and get those tested. And actually the state turned those around in less than 48 hours, which I viewed at the time and still do as some kind of a miracle considering what time was going on. And so from then on, we knew that we had COVID here. And we also knew that many cases were gonna be asymptomatic as was previously said. And since then we've had multiple small clusters in churches and other groups uh, in a congregate care center. So we've had to go working on those. The first congregate care center we had that had a positive case, we did a little mild surveillance activity. And of the 10 or so uh, tests we did on staff, five of them were positive and they didn't have symptoms. So that just shows we knew it was, was here and it was in our community and there were, there were people without symptoms. 
So as the testing evolved, Lakeland did a great, Lakeland Spectrum did a great job of getting more and more tests available. And we ended up with a relatively test rich community. We had more tests to be able to do. And Lakeland's been very good about letting us use those for surveillance activities and other activities, sometimes in conjunction with them. One of the things we established early was sort of a strike team. So we knew that a congregate care center or a, or a nursing home or a, or a skilled nursing facility had um, a, a, someone sick, we would go down and be able to test that person, one or two contacts to them, maybe their roommate, maybe the staff that took care of them were able to do that. So there were several times we would go out with a really quick little surveillance issue, like once the Westwood Niles recently, we heard there was a sick staff person, we heard there might be a sick uh, person that was uh, a resident there. So within three hours, our strike team was down there, got the testing done, ran it up the Lakeland Spectrum, who zoomed it out at their 11 o'clock shipment up to Spectrum North, and that evening we had the test results from the place. So that's the kind of way testing, the strategy has always been to prioritize how we use it, try to use it judiciously, and in a timely fashion to help craft what we're doing. So we've been very happy for that relationship. Now we're in a situation where we have a relatively higher volume ability to test, and there's also groups coming in from the outside testing. For instance, there are still nursing facilities that have now come in and tested their whole facility. That, is, that, that testing was done through the test kits that the outside facility, either from um, Indianapolis or elsewhere, brought in. So we've had several places that have been tested completely. One of the places was 207 tests were all done in 24 hours. So that, that's the kind of, so testing has certainly um, evolved, but we still have to try to prioritize how we use these tests because we have to hold some back to be able to, for the next big event, should it happen, that we're able to be able to test in a timely fashion that people really need to be tested. The next thing you talk about is contact tracing, and Nikki will show you a nice graph about that, but Nikki, uh, contact tracing is uh, sort of the hallmark of what public health sort of does, and we've uh, worked really hard, and hard on that. But I just talked about the human side of contact tracing. Our staff has done a great job with contact tracing. We have track traced more than 3,500 people now which wow. is a huge number. And that's, and it's not just, hi, how are you? You've, been, you've had somebody that, you know, you've come in contact with had it. We go in depth with the people, find out issues about them and really, really help them. And I'll just give you a couple of short stories of one, one of the people um, that we did was a really sad case of, of involving a death. And um, the person on there, our staff person was just great with them. And he said, oh, I know Dr. Johansson. Could you get him to call me? So I called him back. And we just had uh, stuff that just doesn't happen everywhere. They just was able to do. We had recently, uh, you'd have tears in your eyes if you heard our contact tracer talking to a family that just lost their mother mm -hmm. and talking to them about the contact and their tests turned positive. Uh, it was truly amazing. And something that was just done shows the dedication of our staff. So contact tracing is a really important thing we've done. Also in contact tracing, we find out what a great community we have. So we're doing a contact tracing with a police officer who says, I heard that there's something, this was earlier, I heard there's something about donating plasma and maybe that would help somebody. I'd love to donate my plasma. That was before that was widespread out there and a police officer is telling our contact tracers he wants to do that. I view that as a great statement about our community. Um, and then next, uh, just talking about our partners. We've had great partners. Working with Lakeland has been a very good partner. We've worked with intercare, law enforcement, schools right from the beginning were involved in, in doing stuff with us. So those are all things that have just been, you know, great. And I'd say from a personal doctor standpoint, I've got to interact with some really terrific doctors. There are, and the, the, who I'm interacting with really changes over time. There were periods of time where I'd be talking to Dr. Hamill every other day. Then I'm talking to the infectious disease doctor, Dr. Froggett every other day. Then the next, uh, Dr. Nolan, head of the emergency room services. And, and so the list goes on. Then, then the more recent balls are with the doctors who are in charge of the long-term care units and skilled nursing facilities. So there's been this uh, dialogue with these people, which has been really, really good of great partners. And then lastly, I'll just talk about PPE, uh, something that you know, a lot of people wouldn't think much about PPE, but of course that's been a big one. With that too, we've had to prioritize, had shortages. At uh, times we've done things like used uh, a small PPE gift package to reach out to our over 120 adult foster care places. 
we bought a very small number, seven or eight face masks and some information. But the main thing was we made contact early on with all of our adult foster care places, told them where they could get information, where they could go to our robust, robust website to find out more stuff and who they could call if they had a problem. So it was a very small gesture gift of PPE, but it went a long way in relationships with our people. Um, so lastly, just um, four days ago, uh, the CDC on a conference call that uh, we could access here, it was for health departments. Um, they stated that this is a, now a time of true transition. Uh, we need to start uh, getting some things back and to scale back some of our activities but they stated that the focus really needs to still be on long-term care units, homeless populations, jails, and the vulnerable population. And I totally agree with that. I think that's really important. And we here are striving to do that. So what is public health? What is public health? As Dr. Emery said, sometimes drove us crazy and people around the room are rolling their eyes. But public health is all of those things that I mentioned above, that's all public health. But public health isn't just COVID. And I'll just give you two little vignettes of things that just noticed earlier and these will resonate with you. I'm watching somebody get their kid out on a bike, a little new bike rider, and the mother carefully puts a face mask on them um, while there's no helmet as they ride down the road, wobbling down the road. There are other aspects of public health besides COVID that we still need to work on. Not to mention the people outside of the building who have their face mask up over the top of their head dragging on a cigarette or vaping. We yeah. still have all kinds of other work to do. So, um, you know, as, as, we, as we're thinking now, we must, you know, public health is also our community, what's best for our community, and the quality of life of the individuals in our community. So I think we have to look really, really careful at the risk benefits of what we're doing at any given moment. And, and I think that's a, a huge challenge, you know, as we start slowly emerges, whether it's regional or otherwise. So thanks for letting me give a little sermon, but just want to give a little historical perspective of what's going on in, in, in our community. Thanks a lot. Uh, before we continue on, are there any questions about the dashboard? Have, have any of you seen this already? I have a question. Yeah. Oh, I just, and I appreciate, as was said earlier, all you guys done in, in the, in the, in the uh, dashboard. Uh, but one of the things that seem to be uh, interesting is that we're an outlier. <clears throat> if we have near 500 cases, given our county population, that's almost, what is it, 3% or something like that. I mean, it's pretty Jolly. high. Joe, there's a, we're the, about the only county that's doing presumed cases also. And if you actually look at the number of actual cases, the way everybody else is calculating them, we are number 15 in, in like in deaths and we're somewhere right there in, in cases also. And we're exactly the 15th sized county that there is. So our deaths and our cases actually, I don't know the exact line of our case right now, but it fits in very nicely with what, what the rest of the state is. So we're like the only ones doing this presume, which I think is important to do this. Uh, oh, yeah, I do like that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It gives, a, it gives a much better picture. And some of those are people before testing even happened. In the beginning, our contact tracing was doing people that were sick that had epidemiological links and were sick with the exact symptoms. So that is some of our cases from way back when, which was uncapturable in a pre-testing world. The state has promised that they're going to be doing this. They they said that they were going to do this across the state, what, three weeks ago, maybe? April 15th. Yeah, and we decided, that, yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, we were already starting to put it together and, and had it rolling before they even suggested it. And then they said they were going to roll it out the next week, and that's three weeks ago. So that's that's just us. Doctor, I have a quick, quick question following up on Joe's. Of the presumed cases, do those ever get add, added into the recovered cases or are those just two separate populations that we're considering? So there's two separate populations. Can't, we're, we're unable, the way everything is tracked, to have somebody who is a presumed or probable case to make it into recovered. So we're sitting at about 320 confirmed cases this morning. Of those 320, 204 have recovered. That's correct. 
So this is Peg. I have a question about kind of the rollout of testing, Dr. J. It sounds like um, the level that we are right now is um, focusing on those uh, care facilities, but maybe jails, homeless, long-term care. Um, do you, when do you project that the uh, testing will go to a wider population? Uh, that's a very good question, Peg. So the governor has said that she wants to be able to weekly test one to 2% for the population. So if you look at that for us, that's about 250 to 300 tests per day. We're, if we, it's over the 1% number. We're very, very close to that. And of course, those days that the outside groups come in, we definitely need to make it. But we've just been working with Lakeland Spectrum. That's an ongoing conversation about how many tests do we use on this day or this week, what's available. And we have to do it a little bit in conjunction with what's going on in Grand Rapids. So that that's uh, that we're, we're getting close to that number now. And uh, so we're, we're thinking more or less, we're gonna do 50 to 100 in LTCUs per day and then 100 to 200 elsewhere, depending on you know what the situation is, where there seems to be a, a new sick case. What about contacts? Uh, people calling in the virtual doctors. Other doctors can order the tests now. So we're keeping that all in mind. So we're we're at the one percent number that the governor sort of wanted. Uh, Rick Ken Edwards here, wondering if you could give us an update on the uh, antibody testing that'll be so important in identifying people that have hopefully develop some immunity? Well, antibody testing is, uh, I, still, I still think it's down the road a ways. I think there's only like five truly, totally validated tests done by, that the CDC accepts. And there's something like 60 to 70 others. And so there are some people who are doing some of those blood tests in our region, um, but it, it's very hard to know what those blood tests actually say no one actually knows for sure if it definitely confers immunity for a long time. Um, they've even found now in some of the later research that different people trigger different antibodies. So it's, it's a little bit problematic to use that. And, and a lot of people have sort of used, can we use this as a way to emerge and say, okay, so my business has seven people, they're now immune, I can put them on the front line. That, that we're not really there yet. That's I would say what every pretty much expert would say on that topic. Where I see it first really being used will be finding out immunities of healthcare workers and those who um, are the front lines of LTCUs, et cetera, and, and in hospitals. I, I think that's what's gonna happen, but it's not quite there yet. Then. It's Linda, I'd like to ask a question. Um, um, I am concerned about getting my people tested because they are going out to multiple, uh, they essentially are healthcare workers, home healthcare workers without um, as close contact. And I, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to be cautious and not take the tests away from those who are symptomatic, but um I, I, I think that there is a, some significant risk if I have someone who's asymptomatic um, who is going out to 20, 30, 40 houses a day. Well, the testing of asymptomatics, depending on the situation they're gonna be in, is definitely problematic. For one thing, you, you don't, somebody could test negative today, but be in the pre-incubation period and tomorrow will be sick and, and coughing. So how many people then do you test and how often do you test them? Every three days, every five days, every seven days? It's just very problematic to, to do relatively lower risk people who can do PPE and to do it well. That's the thing I would emphasize. And then when you have a sick individual, get them tested. And then maybe we do some surveillance of a couple of people that they work with where we have a, a, a little bit more of a chance of actually finding someone. So there is one long-term just care facility around here that tested over hundred people. Well, they had no outbreak and no sick people, no persons of interest as their call. So every person was tested and not one was positive. Okay. So okay. That, that was that we didn't use those tests, those were used from the outside. 
that shows you some of the problems of just why testing large numbers of people. And the same question you're asking is asked by police and all kinds of others. Sure, oh, I'm, I'm sure. Um, is and, I, and, and some, some of your questions might be answered. Maybe we should yeah. move on to, Vicki has a PowerPoint here, which is great. We yep. probably should go yep. through that. It may answer some of the questions. Yep. I'm not trying to cut you off. Courtney's going to talk a little bit about what our operations have been. All right. So as Dr. Jay kind of talked about. Uh, you need to move closer okay. to the microphone, Courtney, please. Okay. Here. I'll just walk up Thank here. you. Um, one, one thing that Dr. Johansson alluded to is it's been really important to us to have ongoing operations while we are responding. That of course has had to take different form and format, um, but we do a lot of critical and essential public health services for the community that if we just take those all away, we'll have other problems on top of um, responding to COVID-19. And so what you're seeing on the slide is really just a really high level snapshot of the types of adjustments that have been made in the department. Um, definitely not inclusive, but I think it gives a really good example of where we've had to kind of amend things. There are some things that have been put on hold, some based on decisions we've made internally as a department, others because schools are closed. And so we're not going to be doing school-based education when there is not a school facility that is open. So as we move through this, we've kind of put these into our, our bucket service areas. And again, it doesn't include everything, but in our clinical and community health world, we really wanted to make sure that our critical health services that we provide in our clinic continued to be available and continued to be provided to um, residents who needed that. So um, examples of that are, of course, TB work is still ongoing. We're not going to leave someone untreated or do the, not do those investigations. Other communicable disease investigations are still going to be needed even during COVID and our nurses are going to be doing that as well. Um, in our sexual health and family planning area, still providing contraception, so birth control to, to our, our women in our community who need that. A lot of those um, medications are administered monthly, and so you can't go eight, 12 weeks and not have that. Um, and so, and as well as some STD testing. Um, what we are doing with all of these services in our clinic is we are not doing any walk-ins. Everything has been moved to by appointment only. And what that allows us to do is to have pre-conversations with our patients and our residents before they come in. One, for a purpose of doing some pre-health screening. If someone is sick or not feeling well, we, we reschedule that appointment. Um, but also to get as much information as we can over the phone. So the time that someone is actually here in our office is as short as possible. Um, in our, that also allows us appointment spacing. So while we are doing appointments, there is a little bit of a, a lesser capacity there because we are trying to keep it that we don't have a waiting room full of people, that we have maybe one person waiting while we're getting someone out, that we can keep that appropriate social distancing in our office spaces. Um, Additionally, when someone arrives at our department, and this is actually true for all of our staff as well, we're doing at the door health screenings um, and ensuring that a face covering is, is provided if someone does not have that. So following strict health screening and masking protocols for all of our staff and for our clients. Um, clinic is really our primary area where we are still seeing people by appointment and that includes WIC. Um, we have actually been really, um, grateful for some of the adjustments that have been made to the WIC program from the federal level through the USDA and state of Michigan that we've been able to do a lot of our WIC services over the phone and via telehealth. Um, we've also done some telehealth appointments for, for sexual health and family planning as well. Um, our nurse practitioner, Jen Pratt, has been great at finding new accommodations to get people seen and to, to meet needs. Um, and so no one in our WIC, so kind of jumping back to it, has gone without benefits. We have made sure that their food benefits are extended, that resources that our families need are being given to them. So that has been our priority through this whole thing. Um, and so then you'll kind of see some of the things that are paused. We did pause some of our, what we would consider maybe non-emergent things that we could. So we did more just walk in Wednesday STD screenings. We are not doing that right now. Again, we want to keep that social distancing. We can't just have a few
people in and out. We want to protect our residents. We want to protect our staff. Um, and same with immunizations. And some of that is also, we have pulled all of our public health nurses into contact tracing. So some of the numbers and things that Nikki will share later will certainly show we have needed that staff capacity to contact so many people across our department. And I think this is really a testament to our staff that some people have fully on a full time job have been pulled into COVID activities, contact tracing, um, planning activities, data activities, communication activities, and others are wearing dual hats. 50% of their time is still supporting normal program operations and 50% of the time we're, we're asking for that mind shift and they're helping in another way. So that, that has been something that we've really worked through as well. Um, in our family program area, we have continued to be in contact with all of our families who are in the Michigan Adolescent Parenting and Pregnant Program, as well as Nurse Family Partnership. Again, those staff are wearing some dual hats. We've needed to pull them in other directions to help with response activities, but they've all continued to follow up with their families as well. We are not doing at this time home visits. There we go. So everything is over the phone and telehealth. Um, and then if there are emergent needs that our families have, we are, we are supporting those, making sure that families have food and diapers and formula, that sometimes it's just the conversation with their case manager because it's been a stressful week and they've been at home a long time and haven't seen other supportive people in their lives. So that is ongoing. Um, of course, some of our group activities we've not been able to do, but we are getting really creative and trying to get better at Zoom, as you can all see here. So we're starting to we're starting to pilot some of our services, our um, positive parenting program, and other things via Zoom. Um, we've had a couple really good successful um, online courses, so we hope to grow that as our months go on. Um, and actually, it might just be in a rural area, a way to connect with some of our families who couldn't always make it into a place. So we'll, we'll find a balance there. Um, and so then kind of continues with public health promotion and environmental health. A lot of it is really those high priority things that we, we want to make sure that we're still um, aware of. And substance abuse prevention, still doing campaigns. We know during this time, mental health and um, substance abuse is still on a lot of people's minds, more so even being shut in so much, having life course change, not working, not having your normal schedule. So making sure that we're still getting really good messaging out, that we're supporting our, our vendors to make the right and the wise choices in how they are doing their retail. Um, and then in this area is where we're really starting to explore what else can we do with Zoom and virtual classes so starting to kind of continue to plan what does maybe an online smoking cessation class look like while someone is at home. So continuing to make those evolutions. Um, environmental health has probably been impacted greatly um, in some of their services just from executive orders and what's closed and what's operating. Um, we've continued, restaurants are still operating, of course, in a different capacity, but our team is still doing those inspections. We certainly don't want a foodborne illness outbreak while we are working through COVID. Um, and there's just been different things that we can check in on. How are, how are things going at restaurants as far as using masks or ensuring that people are not waiting in large groups to pick up food, that those practices are moving forward. So our team has really adapted to pick up different things to shift how they're supporting businesses. Um, and then Again, a lot of this has been in, impacted by executive order needs. Um, so we're really responding to emergent and emergency well and septics and those mm -hmm. types of things. I think just the final note on this is continuity of operations for our department is an ongoing activity. Um, each week, it tends to evolve on what we're seeing in the community. What can we begin to figure out? Where do we layer back on? What services can we get more savvy at and have electronic and telehealth and virtual opportunities? Um, so we are already beginning to plan what does June look like for our department, starting to include a few more services back in. We haven't done a lot of immunizations. We have kept some of those critical infant um, and young child appointments, but we want to add more of those back in. Again, a few weeks, that's okay. 
we don't want to go a few months. We want to make sure that we don't have other outbreaks when we, we are really focused on COVID. So we're continuing to look towards June. Um, just in our department, that's going to continue to look like not holding big meetings, keeping people separate, doing as much as we can virtual, but then adding in more appointments, ensuring that we're still keeping that social distancing, but, but get back to a, a balance of some of those programs being added in. And a lot of this has worked with the state as well and our funders to know where we can pull back, where we can add in. Um, yeah, and I know Dr. J said this and I'll just reiterate, our team has been great to do this. Um, every health department looks different on a daily basis, but even in this COVID response, every health department has had to make different choices on what they can support. And we really felt that this, this was our opportunity to exercise good continuity of operations and not do more than we, we could support, but really keep critical services for our community that were so important, even when responding to COVID. So that's, that's kind of a snapshot of where we've been with, with operations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Courtney had a question about um, the Zoom meetings and um, I'm finding in River Valley and the New Buffalo school system about 30% of the families are not connected because of um, broadband or Wi-Fi availability. Are you seeing that impacting your service areas or whom you can serve? Yeah, Peg, that is, that, that is definitely a barrier. Um, I will say that for, for example, in our nurse family, just kind of anecdotally, in our nurse family partnership program, we've had a really, um, I would say an easier time getting in touch with moms. And there's been a push to get the national service office actually provided smartphones to different uh. programs to give out to families. And they are paying for four months of service on those phones. Um, wow. It's huge. But then in our teen parenting program, we've had a lot of struggle of being able to connect with teens because they don't have internet access or they don't have minutes on a phone. Um, and so I, I feel like the, the um, connection point has kind of become the transportation conversation. So sometimes when we're having all of these in-person things, transportation has been the barrier. How do we get people here? Now we've, we've shifted to this Zoom virtual telehealth platform, and it has some of those same barriers. So connectivity is definitely a, a barrier we still need to work through. Yeah. Very Thanks. timely question is that on our Healthy Burying Consortium meeting. That was one of the main things we talked about is how do we get our communities connected? It has so much to do with health, jobs, education, so many things that everybody has access. Oh, that, that, it, that, that could be a new really big focus of HBC. Yeah. All right, I'm going to keep us moving along. I'm going to have Jillian keep driving so we don't have to share the mouse. Um, just in terms of the, I don't know how many of you have ever taken any ICS courses, the Infinite Command Structure, mm -hmm. but there is a whole system that FEMA has for a command structure that any organization doing a response of any size or um, for anything would do. And it's got these similar roles. So every organization in theory that's responding to COVID has similar type of roles. And then that makes it so we can partner together seamlessly. So we have built this incident command structure and um, it's basically building an organization within the organization. So as Courtney was saying, we have a lot of people in our, or some of our staff that are devoted full time to COVID response efforts and they fill out this type of in, um, incident command structure. Some of these people are also doing other tasks as well because we are doing things behind COVID-19. Um, but I think it's really interesting um, and something that might not often be overlooked. When you're building sort of this organization within an organization, there's just a lot of effort and adjustment. It's different reporting relationships. It's different expectations on your job and your role. And granted, most of the people filling these things are that's similar to their scope of work or how they kind of fit into BCHD under normal operations, it has been a tremendous amount of flexibility and adaptation from our staff and with doing a tremendous job. Um, so we wanna talk a little bit about flattening the curve. I know this has been a phrase that has really been everywhere. 
um, over the last two months, particularly in the news and um, over the internet, it refers to the epidemiological curve. Um, so instead of having a really high sharp peak that comes down quickly, we want to see a curve that has a flatter peak over a longer period of time. Um, and I think it's important that as we talk about, okay, we flattened the curve, now what do we do? It's important that we don't conflate flattening the curve with the fact that the virus is somehow gone or doesn't pose a risk. It, what it really means is now the hospital has space for you if you become ill. And one of the goals from the very beginning was to try to keep our number of illnesses at any given time beneath the surge capacity of the hospital so that we weren't entering crisis standards of care. When, when we're looking at the data for our country, for our state, um, and we're, we're seeing this flattening of the curve, that, that doesn't mean that we don't still have this with us. Um, but we know that as we extend the transmission over a longer period of time, what looks like it's going to be several, several months, um, this time bought by the slow transmission is still really helpful because it leads to more lives saved from COVID-19. Every week, every month, we're learning more about the virus, so there's improved care options. PPE is becoming better available, so um, healthcare workers are able to be much better protected now than they were in March and even in early April. And the healthcare system also has room for other medically necessary procedures. We're hearing from uh, WMED uh, in general, not just respect to Berrien County, but a trend that they're seeing across the 11, the 11 counties that the medical examiner serves is that they've had a nearly 30% increase in the number of cases referred to the medical examiner, um, but the number of autopsies has not increased. And what that, that is suggestive of is that there are more natural deaths that are happening, say, at home instead of in an emergency room or a hospital, um, but they're natural deaths, so they don't require an autopsy. And that's suggestive that there might be people who are not seeking the emergency health care that they need for a stroke or a heart attack or, or something similar and feel, feeling very fearful of going to the emergency room at this time. Um, and so people, we, there's a lot of evidence out there suggesting that people are avoiding medically necessary procedures. Flattening the curve and what we've done here has created a lot of capacity within the healthcare system to maintain those medically necessary procedures. Um, so that's something that's really important. And time, over time, we know we, we're hopeful that we're getting closer to a vaccine. It does still seem like it's eight to 12 months out, but we are going to see transmission of this virus until we have levels of herd immunity. We can only get to that, those levels of immunity through infection or vaccination. So some of the, some of the things that we are watching for um, and that we're really monitoring here, particularly as it relates to reopening, uh, because we, it's been easier to flatten the curve under the stay home, stay safe order, but that clearly can't continue forever because there are lots of um, other issues that are brought up with everybody, um, quote, sheltering in place. So the key metrics that public health is really watching, what we're keeping an eye on here, is um, the first five are data points. We want to see a decreasing number of new positive cases per day. Now, this needs to be taken in context with all the other ones listed here, because as we do more testing, we will absolutely find more cases. It's not necessarily representative of increased human commission when we know we haven't had enough tests this whole time. So that one needs to be taken in the context of some of the others. But we want to see a downward trajectory of the number of tests done that test positive. So as we test more and more people, we want to be seeing a smaller percentage of those tests coming back positive. Uh, we also want to see a decreasing number of hospital admissions and ICU admissions due to COVID-19. And we want to see a decrease in our, in our number of deaths. So those are sort of the five data points that have been put forth as conditions for um, moving into this next phase. Um, in Berrien counties, for a lot of these, we still have some small numbers. We're not, we're not seeing sharp increases in these. We're not seeing decreases either. There's a little bit of leveling off. Um, and just because we have had, I mean, in the big picture, it's been smaller numbers statistically. Um, we're, we're monitoring these and trying to smooth it out over time. We might see periodic increases or 
There might be mass testing that happens on a certain day in a facility like Dr. Johansson talked about. That would of course drive up a number of cases per day, but we understand why we've been doing that. So we're, we're looking at all these in context. Some of the other um, conditions that are important for a reopening is, is the hospital able to treat patients without resorting to those crisis standards of care? And we've definitely met that condition um, now. Spec health is not near their surge capacity. We'd like to have an ability to test all people who have symptoms of COVID-19. We are not there yet. Um, we're getting closer. And as Dr. Johansson said, there, if we are in a relatively test-rich environment. There are some counties in the state that really, really struggle to get anybody tested. Um, but we still can't test all people with symptoms. Um, a health department ability to conduct contact investigation and contact tracing. We'll talk a little bit more about this right now based on what other complement of services we have open. We have um, ample ability to do this and do this well as we start to add on more services and, and get back up and running with other things that we can't continue to have on pause indefinitely. Um, that becomes something that we, we need to talk through and think through. And then it also has to do with workplaces' abilities to follow workplace safety guidance. And a lot of that guidance is being drafted and um, will be forthcoming. So to give you a flavor of our response activities, um, these are five types of buckets um, our response activities have fallen within. So it's really characterizing and understanding disease transmission in the community, informing the public and decision makers, um, focusing on our most vulnerable, so those most likely to have serious illness or death from infection. We want to create and support infrastructure that prevents new infections, and we want to prevent additional public health crises. And to do this, this is not the work of the Berrien County Health Department alone. While we definitely see ourselves as leaders in this, and it's really important for us to help set that direction, there are so many partners, and I'm certain that I've left many off this list, but I want to give you just a flavor of, of some of the partners that we've been working really closely with to ensure uh, a really strategic and robust response. So we've got some of the usual suspects there in, in healthcare and in the, in the public health structure, we've got education, We've got economic development, local elected officials, some state networks, um, lots from local employers, and, and our residents of Berrien County have also done a tremendous job um, in trying to help with the response by, by doing their part. So we're going to go through each of these buckets. Uh, it'll be fairly quickly, uh, but just to give you a flavor of what are some of the activities we're doing in those buckets of response activities. So we are definitely tracking and monitoring and con uh, communicating the confirmed and the presumed cases. We're tracking hospitalization and ICU admissions and those trends over time. Um, it's been a lot that all of that seems really simple at face value, but to actually have all of the, the data systems be able to talk to each other and share some of that information, um, especially when we don't have necessarily here at the health department, a software that really tracks and monitors or can build that dashboard that you saw. Um, those are not things we, tools that we've always readily had at our, at our fingertips. So it's been a lot of effort to be able to monitor this in the way that so that we have intelligence about the situation to be able to make informed decisions. That was so great when my aunt was in the hospital to be able to talk to Karen Courtbean and she had access to the chart and was able to tell me things. It, it helped me. I didn't want to take the nurses away or the doctors away from necessarily what they were doing because they were actually doing the care. But it was nice to have be able to, to talk to someone and they were able to access that information for me. It was great. That was so wonderful. Great. Um, we've also been, from the beginning, we especially, you know, back in late March and early April, um, we really just, we knew that we were unable to test very many people. We were not, we did not have access to many of the test kits. We knew a lot of people were uh, likely had COVID, but were not able to be tested. So we actually did some case finding and working with Spectrum Health Lakeland, and we were able to work to have a flag set up in the electronic medical record to where the, um, the um, 
provider would be able to indicate, yes, I think this person might have COVID, but then they won't be tested because there wasn't a test available and they didn't meet the, the criteria for who was being tested at that time. So we were receiving daily a list of people in the emergency room, uh, which a lot of those ended up becoming presumed cases, but we would contact those individuals, we'd notify them about um, their need to isolate, how to prevent infection spread, a lot of the same things we were doing with our confirmed cases and contact tracing for there, but that helped us get a better picture of where were people in our community who were experiencing COVID-like illness, um, but not showing up in our confirmed test results. So that was really important. We've also been just doing some surveillance of dispatch calls. Dispatch, when um, anybody, when they receive a call for uh, emergency response, there is a series of screening questions they ask so that first responders know whether they're walking into a, a, a situation that has even heightened risk for COVID. Um, and so we've been able to get some of that information so that again, we had another data point for really understanding where where COVID might be circulating in our community. Um, and we've done some surveillance testing in long-term care facilities to, to better characterize transmission and population status as well. So we've also um, been done a lot of work with trying to inform the public and inform decision makers. And definitely in the beginning before we started having our first cases, but I'd say this holds true throughout the whole, all response, this has largely been a response of communication. The public has, um, and decision makers, really needed to know a lot of information in very rapid succession. Uh, having a baseline understanding of some of the concepts underlying this, not everybody is very familiar with infectious disease spread and how transmission occurs, what protective factor or preventive measures make sense, which ones might be overly burdensome without adding value. Um, and there has just been a lot of response. I mean, you saw all of the partners before, and there's so many others. Everybody is moving in this direction of how do we respond to COVID. Um, so getting information out there has been really important. So we do have a joint information center, also known as a JIT. Um, that is something that comes from that um, incident command structure from FEMA. But that is a way that we can make sure we have coordinated messages that go out to the public. So County representation, health department, and Spectrum Health Lakeland are all represented in the JIT. And when we send out messages, we work to send them out jointly so that we're not giving conflicting messages. Um, and we do press briefings and Facebook Lives that same way. Not really press briefings anymore because the media is not traveling. Um, the data dashboard has been an important part of this. The social media um, campaign and just presence and really using that as a vehicle for getting accurate information out has been really important. I've participated in several Teletown Hall meetings as a panelist invited by an elected official, both um, at the federal and state level. We've done a lot of just individual consultation, education, advocacy. A lot of this is coming through our hotline, but there's a lot of other venues that comes to us. And we've been really doing our best to try to keep our partners as updated as possible with emails and teleconferences and just making sure that there's really good information. If people really, if people know what what else is going on in the response, we can find better ways to collaborate. If people understand um, the nature of this, of this response, they can also make better decisions within their organizations of how they care for their people. So next we've been working to really focus on the most vulnerable because we know uh, this has just been interesting. And you, we see this with many infectious diseases, but there are going to be some people that are um, asymptomatic, probably a larger percentage than, than we realized um, from the beginning that are asymptomatic, will never know they were infected. Um, there will be a lot of people mildly ill, but then we know this could be very, very serious um, for our more vulnerable populations. And Dr. Johansson touched on this quite a bit. So we have had a, a big focus on our long-term care facilities. And I'm using that term very broadly. This means nursing homes, assisted livings, adult foster care, um, numerous other types of facilities um, that our most vulnerable populations um, are likely to live in. We also have densely populated public housing complexes, uh, that dense population and access to resources, uh, limited access to resources is something that um, we're paying attention to. 
migrant workers. This is the time of year where we're having migrant workers arrive in our community. Intercare is a great partner. They do a lot with um, health assessments in this population anyways, and we have worked with them on some of that planning and how do we make sure that we are effectively reaching and intervening in this uh, community. We've been doing work to assess and understand the needs of those serving our homeless population um, and those who have transient living situations. We're definitely trying to work with communities of color as some of the board members alluded to earlier in the meeting. We, and you saw on the data dashboard, we do have a disproportionate impact of COVID-19, both in infection um, and deaths for amongst people of color. And so trying to intervene and make sure that we, we have protective factors in place in those communities to protect um, those individuals as well and incarcerated individuals. We're working um, with the Sheriff's Department to make sure the jail remains a safe situation um, and that people are not, um, there's not an outbreak in the jail. But then we also have individuals who have been maybe paroled from the prison system and the Michigan Department of Corrections in uh, four or five facilities have had pretty significant COVID outbreaks. And so individuals leaving those facilities on parole then have to do a, a quarantine period because they're considered exposed until the time they leave that facility. So there's been a lot of those things that um, we've been working through. Um, and as Jillian mentioned with the um, resolution you approved for the grant application for minority health, we've been exploring a lot of just non-traditional communication mechanisms, really utilizing informal leaders to communicate and amplify messages because we know Berrien County Health Department, Spectrum Health Lakeland, we don't have a deep reach. We're not reaching everybody. So we want to make sure people who have a deeper reach are getting into pockets of the population that we just don't engage well, that those individuals have accurate information that they can spread. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the next thing is just creating and support infrastructure to prevent new um, infections. And I use the term infrastructure because we want to make sure that we have we have these things in place. Um, some of it might be able to stay in. Um, there might be things that will have longer lasting impact, but we. As Dr. Hansen says, we do have a countywide testing strategy. Um, the health department doesn't hold all of the tests. We are not a gatekeeper to the tests. Our healthcare partners are doing the testing, but we're working to convene and make sure that there's the partnerships and the relationships so that we are doing it strategically, that there's not gaps between who's being targeted. And this is continuously evolving as the situation and testing availability changes. Um, we are setting up our infrastructure to make sure that we're able to do contact tracing appropriately. Um, having some technology to aid in that task, to streamline that would be really um, helpful and important. And I'm gonna talk about contact tracing in, in, just in more detail in a minute. We've set up an isolation and quarantine facility so that if there are people who do not have a home or a safe place to isolate um, after an infection or quarantine after an exposure, um, so this is geared more towards those who are homeless or transient living situations or that live in a congregate setting, um, but don't require hospital, hospitalization. Um, we do have a facility in a um, somewhat confidential location that we are uh, have on standby in case we need that. We've been doing a lot of training and provision of PPE to long-term care facilities. A lot of the um, long-term care facilities, their staff and practices haven't always been very robust with infection control practices. So there's been a lot of that training. This has been done in, in partnership with Spectrum on Lakeland. And we're working to deepen our ties with informal leaders in communities um, for that communication and amplifying accurate information. Like I mentioned, we, will, we want those to become more permanent relationships and not just once COVID's done, we, we stop utilizing um, that. And we're working with our business and economic development uh, community and, and uh, partners here for guidance for reopening workplaces. Um, and lastly, just working to prevent additional public health crises. Uh, that has been a huge driver of our continuity of operations. Could we have made our lives easier by shutting down more of our services so that our staff didn't feel quite as spread thin? Possibly, and some other health departments in the state of Michigan did make that choice. Um, we felt it was really important to continue what we were doing so that we didn't have um, 
uh, other potential public health crises pop up. Um, we're also really trying to work with the, the public and our partner, our healthcare partners to try to help build trust and in infrastructure and ways to make sure that medically necessary care that's not COVID related is also being sought and, and provided. Um, the economic recovery efforts and just safely reopen, and having health and safety top of mind during reopening is also really important. We know that the economic devastation from so many people having lost jobs and being on unemployment or having their work hours reduced such that they don't qualify for unemployment, but they are also um, not getting their full paychecks or what, what their family is accustomed to. There's a lot of ways that people have been economically hit by this. Um, and there's some mental health impact to this physical disconnection we've, we've all been feeling. So how do we balance those, the long-term potential public health impact of those things while still protecting and trying to slow and prevent some transmission of COVID-19? Um, and we also see this as a way to just use and continue to grow our equity and resilience lens. If there was ever a time that we needed to be doing our work with an equity and resilience-based lens, it's now. And this has been really good practice and application for, for our team. And then um, we had also, you had approved a grant that we had received to do a community health improvement plan this summer and fall. And that's definitely going to look a lot different, but we also see that as an opportunity to have that be a community health improvement and recovery plan. We, we know there's lots of things here. There's lots of groups that want to drive in that direction to have a plan for how do we pay attention to these things. Um, so we're, we're rolling with that and adapting um, how that's moving forward. So I wanted to go just a little bit deeper into the case investigation and contact tracing as this is somewhat the bread and butter of traditional public health as Dr. Johansson is mentioning. And I think it's, it's important that we understand how, how the disease spread and have this. So you see here in the red and the orange on the screen don't look dramatically different, um, but we have an index case and all the circles are people and the lines represent their connections. So the, the red dot has connections with the two green dots and could potentially um, transmit the virus to those individuals. Then the green people are connected to the orange people and could take and transmit the virus to the orange people. So orange is getting infected from red, even though orange and red don't or have that contact. And then it goes so on down the line. When we're doing our contact tracing and case investigation, we're gonna ask the red index case a whole lot of questions to understand more about what's going on and collect all of the relevant information. And then one of those questions are, okay, who are those people? So they're gonna give us the names of the green people. We're gonna contact the green people, determine if they're, uh, if they're experiencing symptoms. If they are, we're gonna to work to try to get them tested. And um, if they're not experiencing symptoms, they're still going to be asked to quarantine um, during the incubation period, the 14 days from their last exposure. Um, but we're going to continue to monitor them over time to see if they develop symptoms during that time period. And if they do, that's when we then go down and ask for their contact. So there's all along these different levels, there are ways that people can be tested and become confirmed cases themselves. If somebody doesn't get tested, but they have all the symptoms and they have that connection to a confirmed case, that's how you become a presumed case um, by that case definition. But with our contact investigation and contact tracing, we are trying to find these lines of transmission. And over the next several months, and what we, why we've been talking about this in the national um, stage so much, is these are ways that we could stamp out lines of transmission. So if we have adequate testing, anybody who, who has symptoms um, is able to be tested, and then we can test the contacts around that confirmed case then we, we can work to stamp out some of these lines of transmission instead of having it continue to go on. Is that possible to do for every single case? No. Is it, can we impact and slow transmission by having a lot of focus um, in, in doing as robust a job as we can? Yes. And each of these individuals also probably has some other health and maybe social needs that we might be able to connect them to. So it's an entree point to our department in ways that we can connect them to other things that they uh, may be maybe COVID related or not. 
So this graphic comes from um, MDHHS with a little bit of editing um, by me. So the state is working on their test trace isolate um, strategy to where, um, similar to what I just said, we wanna test as broadly as supplies allow. Uh, once we identify confirmed cases, we want to, or probable, um, we are gonna do the contact tracing with the goal of getting anybody who's sick um, into isolation as quickly as possible. What we're doing um, very explicitly in Berrien County and is not as explicit in the state's plan is anybody we identify in that tracing step, we are trying to immediately get them back, get them tested so we know their status. We might be able, um, won't always know if a negative means a negative. We're waiting for a period of time after exposure so that we have better understanding of what that negative is. But we're trying to really do this um, testing paired with the contact tracing to again stamp out those lines of transmission. Um, the state is also suggesting to use technology and tracing teams to rapidly identify close contacts. I, I did intentionally strike through technology there. We do not have a technological solution that streamlines this communication, which means if we go to the next slide, um, our staff has made, these are very conservative estimates, it's probably higher, but our staff there in the green box, we've made over 8,000 phone calls since mid-March. Wow. We, we are calling everybody. And so these numbers are based on the 315 confirmed cases we had as of yesterday afternoon. Um, from that, we've identified probably 2,400 contacts. And that's probably on the low end. Um, the, the strategy has shifted a little bit and some of the documentation has shifted over time. Again, we also, we don't have a software system for really tracking, okay, you know, Nikki is our case and then here are all her contacts and here's the results of what's happening. A lot of this is being tracked through Excel. Um, Mid-April, a lot of this was able to be better tracked in a state system, but it still doesn't track the entire breadth of this work. So we're still working through some of this. Um, we would love to move in a direction of being able to send out text messages to some of the asymptomatic contacts to do the daily check-ins that way. And then they could report back, yes, I'm feeling fine or no symptoms today or, or something like that. And then we'd only have to do the, the phone call for somebody that maybe didn't reply to our text. So we're exploring what some of those options could be, what software's out there, um, and then of course what the cost would be. But I wanna show you the amount of work that has gone into this. So again, with 315 cases, we've identified about 2,400 contacts. And this is during the stay home, stay safe order where people have had fewer contacts. Back in March, before that order was um, fully implemented, the, some of the cases were having 20, 25 close contacts because it was before social distancing measures were really in place. Um, once the orders were in place and there was much more social distancing, it was generally only four or five people and they tended to be in the household or if it was an essential worker, their coworkers. Um, we do expect that as things start opening up, we are going to identify more contacts because people will just be in closer physical proximity that is why it's so important that workplaces implement the health and safety practices. And we've been trying to pitch it as if one of your employees becomes ill, we're going to have to do contact tracing and you might have to quarantine anybody who's had close contact with that individual. Are your masking processes, are your distancing practices, are all of those making you feel confident that you can continue your operations if one person becomes infected in the community? Um, so to do all of this work, um, we've used approximately nine FTEs. So the majority of those have been health department staff. We do have, um, it's four nurses, but it works out to just under three FTEs worth of nurses from Spectrum Health Lakeland that have been loaned to us um, for this purpose. So we have been doing it with six public health nurses and then the, the other nurses from Spectrum Health Lakeland, plus one person, our nurse supervisor, being the, the manager, the project manager overseeing this operation. We've been able to do this fairly robustly with nine people. The CDC recommends that we have 15 FTEs of contact tracing per 100,000 population. So if we go by the CDC standards, that would be 22 FTEs. Personally, I think that's more, more than we need. I think we have a really good system in place. 
Um, we've had a lot of cooperation. Our goal and what we're shooting for, because we expect to have to do this contact tracing for the next several months, we we're shooting to try to have 12 to 15 FTEs doing this. Um, there's a variety of scenarios um, that that could look, what that could look like, but our six public health nurses that are doing this task full time right now are the ones that need to provide immunizations and continue doing their family partnership home visits. And in, as we get more of our services online, we also need them to do some of those things. Um, so one of our, our thoughts for how we could do this um, in the, over the next several months, Jillian, can you go to the next slide? Um, is we, we would like to be able to hire three to five temporary supplemental staff members that could be trained, that could do this task, and that would be full-time hours they'd be able to do that. And we would continue to have health department staff that we assign to this task. Um, because our nurses would be at part-time, we would, and we have already trained these individuals, but we've trained our community health worker, a few of our nutritionists, and our health educator so that um, they could also split time between their, their day job, their, their regular BCHD assignments um, and contact tracing. So there are some of these positions that we think we could manage this all together. A lot of that would be aided by uh, the ability to get some sort of software communication to help automate some of that communication. We don't wanna automate all of it because there's a lot of value in building that relationship, having that warm touch with individuals um, as they're going through a, a time that quite frankly it's very anxiety provoking for a lot of people to know that they've been exposed to somebody with, with COVID-19 um, especially if they're starting to develop symptoms so having that having that warm touch is really important but if we can automate some of it that would save a lot of time um, and, and as I've said, maintaining local control over this task is really important to us. It helps us have um, good quality assurance, and we feel we're, we're able to collect really robust data. Uh, we can implement some quality improvement rapidly. We can learn more about what our community is experiencing, hearing their voice and implementing that into how, how we do things. And again, making meaningful connections with residents um, and meaningful referrals without just saying, well, maybe you should call 211. We, we actually know what the organizations are. We can make those referrals. And that helps us continue to build trust throughout Berry County. We know government, we know healthcare, not always seen as the most trustworthy organization. So anytime we're able to have these, these contacts with community members, make sure that all of their needs are met, um, that can help them see another side um, to us. And so I'll end by saying, this is a, a poster that or saying that I wrote and we've had posted in our boardroom for almost uh, two months now and what we've been really trying to think through, but the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist just expects it to change and the leader adjusts the sails. And our team has really, really been trying very hard to not complain about the wind and not just expect it to change, but to really focus on adjusting the sails. Wow. Uh that's quite a quite a presentation, uh, Nikki. Um, thank you. Uh, wonderful to see. Um, I'm wondering with our county board, uh, what has been your interaction with the county board? Because it looks like uh, Bill. It looks like we have some expenses that might be coming. Um, has there been a presentation by the health department to the board? Uh, thanks, Peg. Yes, uh, Nikki does an excellent update, not, not as detailed as this, uh, for us every time we have one of our Zoom meetings. Um, and uh, she, she really keeps us very well advised. We also uh, hear from the EOC uh, things that are going on. Uh, in terms of resources to go to the next level, I don't think we've had any dialogue around those things, um, and we're gonna we're gonna need to do that in short order. I think we're uh, we're struggling with how we get our business done, but right now our only real important business is being supportive of Nikki and the EOC and and dealing with our communities as she's outlined. 
And there are four county commissioners that um, are involved in the EOC. And so they have regular meetings with um, the emergency manager and the county administrator. Um, I've been in contact with that group of commissioners as well. And so there, there is some understanding. There hasn't been opportunity to do as robust communication as to what I, I just did with the board. Um, and I believe that there is a process. Um, we've been working with the county administrator on what some of our needs are, um, resource needs are, and impact too, because not only do we have, like everybody, we have increased needs to respond, but there's also some revenue hits. Um, so we've been working with the county administrator. I believe he's going to be presenting more of a total picture of what's going on in the county commission maybe next week. I don't, I don't know the exact timing of that, but we're working through with our county partners um, to try to see how to negotiate this because there's lots of needs. Thank you. Are there, I'm cognizant of the time, but are there some short questions for yeah. Nikki that we can? Yeah, uh, I, I just have, have one. Um, I mean, this is phenomenal. I, I've always been a proud to be a part of this board, but never more proud than this time. You guys have done a phenomenal job rising to the occasion. Incredible. Great data, great organizational plan. I'm so proud of you guys. But, and you said herd immunity is, is crucial, mm -hmm. but without wide community testing, how will we know when we reach herd immunity? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's a really, um, that's something that's missing. And to Dr. Jay's point, the antibody testing um, has some, some have been touting that of let's do population wide antibody testing when we know that we're at herd immunity. Um, we're just not there. That would be lovely. We want that data so that we can respond to that data and act appropriately. We just don't have the ability to do that. I think some of the ways that we'll know we're reaching levels of herd immunity, though, are we'll start to see it in the numbers. We're going to start having fewer cases. We're going to have that decrease um, percent positivity amongst those who are tested. We're going to start seeing fewer infections. All of those things that were helping us understand that it was here that it arrived and where it was, as we continue monitoring those things, I expect we're going to start to see shifts in those, which is why it's been so important to us to have some of those informal um, surveillance mechanisms that aren't perfect, but they help us have that pulse on what's going on. I don't know if you're going to need to add that. One of the things we, one of the ways we are doing surveillance is sort of a twofer. When we test staff from long-term care units, those, the staff there, they're not getting it from the residents. You know, actually, they're giving it to the residents. So where are they getting it from? They're getting it from the community. So when we test them, especially when we test their asymptomatic ones, we really do get a, some snapshots of what's going on in terms of herd immunity. So, for instance, Westwood Niles, there was 170 staff members there checked. So 22 of them are positive. They were virtually all asymptomatic. They come from all areas of our county. Um, and a couple actually come from Indiana. So we actually are getting, uh, what, every time we do a, a point prevalence kind of activity like that, we are learning things about our county. And we can also infer some things because if, if you just look at, you know, what are our deaths like? What are our, what's our incidence rate? We're a lot like a lot of other counties. So we're gonna be able to pool some data and see, you know, what's, what's going on. So I think we're gonna learn a lot by activities like that. One thing we're not going to know is, um, you know, how seasonality is also going to affect this. We, we just don't know. And um, that, that could be a great hope, at least temporarily, to give us a respite. Mm -hmm. Thank As you. things open up, I'm sorry, Dr. McBride, were you saying something? Okay. As things open up, are you concerned about um, more cases? So, I mean, the short answer is yes, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So we know, um, we know that having everybody mostly stay home has been really helpful in really slowing transmission. We've reduced, if you think back to that slide I showed with the circles and the lines, we've reduced the amount of lines between all of the circles, and so that slowed transmission. Obviously, as we start to emerge more from our homes and we leave for non-essential things, um, a non-essential, it's really hard to define what is an essential reason, um, but for non-life-saving reasons, we begin to leave our homes. Um, there's going to start to be more connections between more of those stops. And this is where those health, safety, and preventive measures 
become really important. Are we wearing masks? I mean, in this room, we're, we're, some of us are wearing masks. I'm not wearing mine, so you can hear me clearly. We're six feet apart. We've got lots of hand sanitizer. Like we're doing the screenings, we're doing all of the things so that as we're here, we are doing everything to minimize the risk. Um, and this becomes a really, really difficult um, cost benefit analysis that I'm not certain we have the actual data to, to really understand, but there is also a cost to keeping everything closed. And knowing that if a vaccine was one month out, it would make sense to just stay closed until you had a vaccine. A vaccine is eight to 12 months out and there are, there's absolutely a cost to having things as closed down as they are. We have to emerge from this period at some point. We need to do it in a way that minimizes that transmission. Um, it might be that that flat part of the curve, maybe we see a slight increase and then we flatten out at a rate slightly higher than where we are right now. That's something that as a society, I'm not sure that we're having a lot of conversation. I don't know that our state or our country is really talking about um, exactly at what point is that flat um, plateauing or leveling off of the curve acceptable. And some of that is based on how do we characterize the cost of what's closed. So it was a really long answer. Yes, we're concerned about it. Yes, we're monitoring it. We're gonna pay attention to it. We're staying really dialed in with our business community so that if there is something, we do see a reversal of the trends and we do need to um, dial back a little bit, we have that option. Right. I think what, as we emerge, we have to also remember that there are some people who should emerge more than others. Mm -hmm. And so as we emerge, we still need to focus in on the vulnerable populations, protecting them. And some people, frankly, should just not be out as often as others. If you're a 72 year old with uh, several comorbidities, it's probably better to have somebody go to the store for you or to be more isolated and be more careful. Um, at workplaces, there are some workers that would be more likely that they should, okay for them to be on the first, on the front line, even using PPE and there are other ones that should be, you know, further back. So I think there's a, a difference in who emerges. At I thought I saw a couple more questions there. I don't know if it's Joe or Dr. Edwards. Do you have a I do have a question. No, I do have a question. Uh, just about antibodies, it's more for my own information, I guess. I understand that, uh, you know, I'm not uncertain. If you do the antibody testing, whether if you have the antibody, can you still maybe able to transmit it to somebody else, uh, COVID-19? Uh, does it really give you immunity for another uh, uh Incidents and uh, if the it seems like I've read some things about the mute, it's mutating a bit, and so I guess just wondering what the you know this whole antibody effort, the concerns about it or you know, the benefit, whatever. Well, the, the concerns are you know does it actually show protection? You know how how accurate is it and how long does that protection last? Those are the unknown things. There are some great things on the horizon. There's a, what are called lateral flow tests that are essentially like pregnancy tests that can just happen right in front of you. And when those get widespread and get the thought to be at least generally good, I mean, those could tell us a lot about surveillance and you know how, how, how we're emerging and how, how herd immunity is going, even if those tests aren't perfect. So there's gonna be a utility for them but to actually say to somebody, you've got a good antibody test, great, you're safe now, you're protected for six months, nine months, a year, whatever, uh, is just not there yet to be able to tell somebody that. Joe brings up a very good point about the, the dilemma that we're feeling in healthcare when it comes to opening up things. Because uh, the antibody test, of course, will maybe give you a suggestion of personal uh, immunity but the real, um, the elephant in the room is the asymptomatic carrier. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, very difficult to know. Uh, how frequently do you test someone? How are we ever gonna know that quite frankly? Um, and uh, to a point, there does come a leap of faith of reopening your society. Um, that is probably gonna result in a, 
increase in some infectivity. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody has the answer to that. Rick, would that be fair? Yeah, that's fair, yeah. There, I think there will be some increased spread, but if you keep it in your mostly in your less vulnerable population, mm -hmm. you're actually, to tie in with Dr. McBride saying, you're gonna be getting herd immunity. I mean, that people are saying, look at the Swedish model, it's not perfect, but that's what they're doing. They're way down the curve and they have, they're developing herd immunity. How long it'll last is unknown. Hey, Just to talk about Sweden for a second. Sweden is interesting because it is the same size as Michigan. They have 10 million people. We have 10 million people. There are obviously differences in their society, but they actually have an older society than us, and they actually smoke at a higher rate. On the other hand, they have more people who work at home and are able to work virtually, and they have they have they don't have the same population density as some of our cities. But if you look what's happened there, they have half the deaths to what Michigan has. And they've been dealing with it longer than us, and they've been pretty much completely open, and they kept schools open beside high schools. So it is. It is uh, there are these are these are some very tough choices, and you know, interesting decisions that need to be made. I have a quick uh, question. What are so we? Wait a second, Ray. I I'm think sorry. Linda had a question, and then we'll get to Ray. Okay, that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think particularly given the, the vulnerability of the senior population, I'm a little concerned having talked to the senior centers. Um, uh, and this, I guess, is a question as, as much for Bill as it is for um, the health department team, but will you give any guidance to them? Uh, I know I'm getting some real pushback on my suggestions about social distancing and things like that, which is giving me some real concern about the advisability of reopening congregate meal sites, for example. Well, uh, Linda, from I think from our perspective, we're relying on Nikki and the EOC to come out with those kind of guidelines. Okay. If in fact, there are guidelines, they need to be created. And I saw on Nikki's slides that that's one of the projects that's being worked on now. So um, that's the voice that has to lead Berrien County right. at this yeah. point. Right, right. And it's in the works. So. Good. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take my lead from you, but I am he hearing some concerning things and I, um, just a heads up on that. <laughs> Uh, Ray, do you have a question? Yes. What is, what is our what are we doing monitoring the mental health of the community and maybe even more as importantly the staff at the health department to begin with? How's everybody coping? What do you mean? <laughs> you didn't throw anything yet, so you must be okay, Doc. <laughs> From a staff standpoint, we are doing daily checks, health health and safety checks. Um, we're it's not only for COVID symptoms and potential infectious illness, but also some emotional and just well-being and check-ins. We know this is a really trying time. I know in my own family, it's been super hard to get groceries. I mean, that is just a really, that is a reality. It's hard to get groceries. It's hard to get some of those things that you, you need that make it okay as you keep coming to work while all of this is turned upside down. And, um, and then we've also had staff that have experienced a lot more loss and um, have been touched really deeply by COVID-19. So we, as a, our leadership team is doing daily check-ins with at all staff, whether that's via phone or in person, depending on somebody's work status or location. Um, but we're trying to assess that. We're trying to find ways to help people um, cope. We're trying to help manage some of the workload as some people are wearing multiple hats we've had to just say okay this is actually this is not tenable we're going to remove one of your hats so that you can continue to focus here because sometimes you just can't so i would say that our health department is, is definitely a reflection of the larger community and that everybody's stress levels and anxiety levels are a little bit high and everybody's um fortitude to just bounce back from something challenging is a little bit decreased. On the whole, I think we're doing all right. In terms of monitoring this um, at the population level, we don't have a lot of really good ways to monitor how everybody's doing. Um, 
other than maybe based on social media comments. <laughs> um, and that might not be the best data point, but it, it seems might be like all we there, have. <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of people that are having just it's been hard to be at home and not doing your normal thing and seeing your normal people. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, any other comments before we move on on the agenda? Meg, just, just one question, maybe. Um, as we move forward, and somebody mentioned uh, mutation here, um, I was just reading about Kawasaki disease, which is now uh, popping up among a very young population, which will be a big concern. How are we managing all of these things that may or may not be included or are the coming <coughs> um, without overly alarming people? Yeah, well, there's a Kawasaki-like syndrome that's with clotting and heart problems and even almost like a, a heart attack of the coronary vessels that happens and there's a rash associated with it. Of course, every time a young case happens, that always makes the news really, really quick. So a 24-year-old dies somewhere. But those are really very, very unique cases. We have to remember that, you know, New York, Massachusetts, and New Jersey are like a left like 11% of the nation's uh, population, but they're 57% of all the deaths. And that's where all the illnesses are. So there have been some of these Kawasaki-like syndromes that have happened there. Several of them are COVID negative, I may add. So we're not exactly sure what the populate, what, what the actual etiology there is. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know if that's something that, um, how, how dramatically that's COVID or not is, is, is hard to tell. Um, but almost always there's uh, there will be other little kind of things that are going to be happening in the midst of COVID that we don't even know. Even, even some of the deaths of children, they may have had another disease process that actually was the thing that, that killed them, but their test for COVID was also happened to be positive then too. So the jury's out on what that Kawasaki thing is. And I have to emphasize some of those cases are, 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 are negative. In terms of virus mutation, viruses do tend to mutate. There is there is something called uh, Mueller's ratchet from way back 40 years ago. It's a public health <laughs> infectious disease phenomenon. And it's where lots of viruses mutate. It's pretty much almost a norm. So that in a way they sort of burn out. And that is something we would love to see Mueller's ratchet happen here. Um, well, I, I guess that the concern I have, Rick, is that, um, you know, everybody is so, cynical, I could say, about how our government responded to this and didn't take this, our federal government, didn't take this very seriously. And as a result, we've lost a lot of time and energy in the process. Um, I, I worry a little bit when we see something pop up and it looks like it may be related or it may be a growing problem and we're not prepared to address it as, as a Thing that needs to be dealt with or no that doesn't really fit into this and I, I don't think we or Nikki is responsible but there's a communications need here somewhere I think. Well I have to remember that the, the, the incidence of this this has happened this, this kind of syndrome thing it happened in China also it is very 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 small numbers so pediatric intensive care units where this will be handled are they're all they're not busy so PEDS ICUs are available everywhere, including in the New York area. And of those cases of this Kawasaki-like illness, all of them have recovered so far. So there's, you know, it's rare, it's able to be handled. And is it how COVID related is are all questions that right now, in terms of the bigger scheme of things, in terms of what we're dealing with, that's a, that to me, even though I'm a pediatrician and work at PEDS ICU once upon a time, uh, that's a very, very, very small issue which will get sensationally jumped in the press. Like, I mean, you know, there, there was a story the other day about how, you know, Berrien County had only so many recoveries, but we had far more new diseases. Well, that was because of the big testing that happened in one long-term care facility. So there are explanations for some things that, you know, jump out in the news, but the story behind them is a little bit different. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's just pointing to the importance of communications and robust communication and trust from the general public. Um, there is so much- Nikki, will you move to the microphone, oh. please? Sorry. I was just saying, I think All that's right. why it's really important that we continue to have a, to have and grow really robust communication and build trust with the community so that as we're exploring different facets of an unknown public health issue or a, a newer public health issue and trying to, to figure out those pieces, we, we believe it's really important to communicate, share what we do know with the public. Mm -hmm. um, because I think sometimes the story that people make up in the absence of information, 99 times out of 100, it's way worse than what the truth might actually be, which is why we strive to be as transparent as possible. I'm wondering if Braden could clip out your presentation, Nikki, um, and the part that really you did the flow charts and where we're focused for uh, distribution. I mean, that was phenomenal. Um, just as where are we, what's happening, what's the health department doing? I don't know, might be, uh, might be something to consider. This, this presentation is archived on YouTube. It will be there for anybody to go watch. Um, but yes, if you have other places you want this shared, we can. Um, Let me push back a little bit, Nikki, because yeah. it's a long meeting with butt time, you know, let's clip part of it um, and consider that. I, I appreciate you too, but um, people may not be willing to sit an hour and 45 minutes or two, two hours watching a YouTube. Got it, yes, that makes sense. Okay. And, and I'd um, encourage sharing it in some of the, even the old fashioned print media. Okay. okay, is there other uh, Berrien County Health Department business you want to highlight or is it time to move to Lisa and the monthly report? I, I'll just mention we do have two resolutions that we were not able to get contracts for and, and bring to you today, but we do expect them to go before the Board of Commissioners sometime this month. One is a contract with King Media to con continue our Dirt on Weed campaign that we did in the summer of 2019 is um, education on medical marijuana as well as recreational marijuana. And um, there's also a contract for consideration for uh, a continuation of some coaching that I have been doing through the Kresge grant. The first period of that ended and we still have a, a significant amount of grant funds to spend. Um, and I'd like to be able to re-engage with that coach. That contract is, I think, 4,000. So those will be taken to the, the Board of Commissioners for their consideration later this month. So there's no way to work with Kresge to reallocate for that uh, automated message or anything like that we desperately need? There, there may be some room for negotiation on that. Um, there would not be on an extension of the timeline, which we've already had extended from March 31st to December 31st. Um, so we're working through what the remainder of that budget would be. It's fairly significant. It's about $60,000 remaining. Yeah, I just think that life changes and, um, you know, certainly with COVID times with Kresge, I'd, I'd be firmly pushing back, so. Absolutely. There's some wiggle room. Okay. All right. All right, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, a couple of things I just want to say right off the front. We're looking at March statements and really the, uh, the, the impact of COVID spending has yet to hit us as of the March financials. Um, and further on, it, it's really hard for me at this point in time to get a, a, a clear idea of what kind of basically revenue impacts we're going to have as, as the year evolves. So um, the information that, that's flowing to us as far as maybe additional funding we need to at a state level is uh, it, it, it's kind of coming in pieces and, and it's hard to get a, a real full picture of that. I think we're in line for 
some FEMA funding, but I, I don't have a clear idea what that impact would be. So um, just to kind of briefly go through the March statements, um, some of this is, is just timing related, especially on the federal and state grant funding line um, compared to budget. And then last year included um, uh, funding for the Benton Harbor uh, water filter program that hit in the first quarter of last year. Um, we are seeing, um, or actually yet to see the full effect of COVID on our permits and licensing lines, revenue lines. Um, I fully expect and, and right now to see potentially a 10% hit on that line. Um, and then also on our clinic end, because we're billing for fewer services, uh, I expect to see a, a revenue impact on those lines too. Um, March doesn't give you a good picture of that. The revenues are cash basis. And um, so especially a clinic, that's a kind of a 30 to 60 day lag uh, on revenues. So we'll see that from, come through in the coming months. Um, on the expense side, we, there really hasn't been a, a COVID impact. Um, expenditure wise, we're working with our, our current staff to cover um, COVID related response. Um, so not seeing numbers there that, that are, are unexpected. Um, and then from a projection standpoint, um, which we're actively putting together numbers on how we will um, address the staffing needs when we have when, when we're fully operational and still um, okay. covering contact tracing. So um, more to come on that. I've, I've done some projections, um, but but the the future is kind of hard to see. Timing wise is a big question for us. How long are we doing sort of 100 percent? contact tracing or, and, and as um, the community recovers, does it increase, decrease? So those kinds of questions are still out there. Um, I have in the, included in your packets projected numbers. Um, I think our, our conservative, um, we have an amount in there for potential contingency if we open up isolation and quarantine facilities. Um, that's probably a low number, but it, it's, or then again, maybe that facility won't be required. So um, very expensive operation though, when, when we move, if we move into that phase. Um, the revenue line on a combined basis, when we're looking at the projected column on that fund statement um, is a combination of some COVID funding that we ha have, well, we're projected to receive um, a reduction in clinic and uh, environmental health licensing. I, I think that's going to be about right now a $75,000 hit. I think we're going to have less uh, food, food services tested um, and potentially even if, if construction. Um, so for our sewers and septic licensing, I, I think we're going to see a hit there. Um, Fortunately, we've all also received this year some additional essential local public health funding. So that helped a bit on that line. So the difference between the budget and the projection is 195,000 and that's reflective of uh, those changes in revenues. Expenses other than the, the, the potential for isolation and quarantine, um, changes there are additional PPE supplies that we've purchased some additional communications, phones, jetpacks, um, and some potential increases for COVID outreach. Um, from a kind of big picture standpoint, what I'm really trying to make sure that we do is balance our grant funding, um, make sure that we, that we use that resource to the best of our ability while also supporting the contact tracing and COVID response. Um, our, each, each funding source is coming out with uh, maybe different restrictions. The grants would like you to continue the grant work. So we're, we're really trying to watch 
that aspect, a lot of our grants are also reimbursement based. So if we're not putting uh, the resources against the grant, we aren't going to necessarily be able to fully utilize the grant. So in a perfect world, I want to make sure that that we basically balance all of our resources and, and come out ahead. But again, it's it's uh, it's tough to predict at this point. Any questions, any specific items you would like me to talk about? Will the government uh, be giving us um, any extra money that you know of to help offset the cost of uh, our expenditures? There, so far, there's a lot of discussion in and not necessarily any specifics. So uh, Vanessa, I, I, I think monies will flow down to us. Um, how it's allocated across the state is a question for me. Um, it, I think it's going to hit the areas that are, are most in need and had the, the largest COVID impacts. So um, I'm, I'm not at this point factoring in a lot of additional revenues. Thank you. All right. Uh, additional questions? Thank you very much, Lisa. I know it, it's difficult to figure out what's going on. So appreciate your trying to figure it out. So, all right, moving to Bill, do you have additional comments on the Board of Commissioners? No, I think what I said earlier about uh, being supportive of this, uh, this effort, that's our All right, thank you. Uh, any questions of Bill? No, All right. Uh, Joe? We'll miss him. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah. So we're moving on to the, I'm cognizant that we have about eight minutes before the two hour board meeting is up, but are there any uh, short discussions that we might have? All right, um, I, I can't- Just commend the staff uh, as you did. Wow, they've done such a great job uh, mm -hmm. dealing with this. Uh, I'm very impressed and very appreciative of all their efforts and how professional and thorough and competent they've been. Thank you. We'll pass that along to the team. Just a little, update from, a little update from Lakeland in terms of, you know, how they're doing in terms of hospitalizations and surge. I mean, we get a report like twice a day. So currently they have, they have uh, 12 people on their dedicated COVID ward at the current moment. Uh, they have a capacity for quite a bit more than that. And in their intensive care unit, they have a separate intensive care unit for COVID positive people. There are 10 people in there and two on ventilators. And, that, and that's been a number that just is wobbled up and down, but it's certainly far less than the capacity they could absorb. But they've done a very, very good job of that. And in their emergency room, they have access to a quick test where we actually can get a result on people coming into the emergency room in 25, 30 minutes. That's used for select people who are potentially gonna be um, uh, admitted or somebody of specific interest and stuff. So that, 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 that's uh, good too. So that's a small percentage of their number of tests, but it's a, it's a really nice tool. Okay, good. Um, I can't see that there's any public on, but I would like to open it up to public comment if there is any. We'll give people a minute to write in the chat box on YouTube. Jillian's monitoring that. Okay. How are you all doing? Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Are you socially isolated, lonely, uh, healthy, what? Good? Working. Healthy. Yeah, okay. working. I, I feel a bit of Zoom prison. I'm not sure my day is on Zoom meetings, so I feel a bit of Zoom prison. <laughs> what day of the week is it? 
If it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. <laughs> so it looks like we're not getting any questions from the public. All right. In that case, thank you for joining. Thanks for all the work that, that Braden did to get us on Zoom and how much that the health department has done. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you much. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks, Bill.